Okay. Namo Isharam Sachidananda Rupam Lasat Kundalam Gokule Vrajamanam Jashoda Biyoluka Ladhavamanam Param Rishtam Atyanta Todrutya Gopya Rudanta Muhur Netra Jyugmam Rajantam Karam Hoja Jyugmena Satanka Netram Mukshasa Kampa Trire Kanka Kanta Stita Graiva Damodaram Bhakti Badham Iti Dreksa Lila Virananda Kunde Sagosham Nimajantam Akya Payantam Tadiye Shita Geshu Vakar Jita Tvam Puna Prematastam Shatavriti Vande Varang Deva Mokshang Namokshavadim Vab Nachanyam Rinehang Vareshara Idam Deva Purnata Gopala Balam Sadame Manasya Virastam Kimanyai Idam Devukam Hojam Atyanta Nilar Ritam Kuntalai Snigda Raktais Jagopya Uhuschumbi tam bimba rakta dharam me Manasya virastam alam lakshala bhai Namo deva damo dharananta vishnu Prasida prabhoduka jalabdi magnam Kripa drishti vrishtyati dinam vatanu Grihanesha mamagyam edyakshi drishya Kuber atma javadha murtyai vajadvat Toya murtita bhakti bhaja krita cha Tadha prema bhakti sukame prayacha Namokshe graho misti damo dareha Namaste studam nes pura dipti dhamme Tadhi odarayata vishasya dhamme Namo radhikaya Tadiya Priyayai Namo Nanta Leelaya Devaya Tubhyam Namo Radhikayai Tadiya Priyayai Namo Nanta Leelaya Devaya Tubhyam Can I read the English? I'm going to take turns doing English. So if you'd like to start us out. Okay. To the Supreme Controller who possesses an eternal form of blissful knowledge, whose glistening earrings swing to and fro, who manifested himself in Gokula, who stole the butter that the gopis kept hanging from the rafters of their storerooms, and who then quickly jumped up and ran in retreat in fear of Mother Jashoda, but was ultimately caught. To that Supreme Lord Sri Damodara, I offer my humble obeisances. Upon seeing his mother's ripping stick, he cried and rubbed his eyes again and again with his two lotus hands. His eyes were fearful, and his breathing quick, and his mother just sort of bound his belly with ropes, he shivered in fright, and his pearl neck was shook. To this supreme Lord Sri Damodar, who is bound with his devotee's love, I offer my humble obeisances. <clears throat> Those super excellent pastimes of Lord Krishna's babyhood drowned the inhabitants of Bokura in pools of ecstasy. 
to the devotees who are attracted only to his majestic aspect of Narayan in Vaikuntha, the Lord reveals, I am conquered and overwhelmed by pure loving devotion. To the Supreme Lord Namadar, my obeisance is hundreds and hundreds of times. O oh Lord, although you are able to give all kinds of benedictions, I do not pray to you for liberation, nor eternal life in Vaikuntha, nor any other boon. My only prayer is that your childhood pastimes may constantly appear in my mind. O oh Lord, I do not even want to know your feature of Paramatma. I simply wish that your childhood pastimes may ever be enacted in my heart. O oh Lord, the cheeks of your blackish lotus face, which is encircled by locks of curling hair, have become reddened like bimbleproof due to Mother Yashoda's kisses. What more can I describe than this? Millions of opulences are of no use to me, but may this vision constantly remain in my mind. O oh, limited Vishnu, O oh, Master, O oh, Lord, be pleased upon me. I am drowning in an ocean of sorrow and almost like a dead man. Please shower the rain of mercy on me. Uplift me and protect me with your nectarian vision. O oh, Lord Damodar, in your form as a baby, Mother just sort of bound you to a grinding stone with a rope for tying cows. You then freed the sons of Kuvara, Manigreta, and Nalakuvara, who were cursed to stand as trees, and you gave them the chance to become your devotees. Please bless me in the same way. I have no desire for liberation into your fortunes. O oh Lord, the entire universe was created by Lord Brahma, who was born from your abdomen, which was bound with a rope by Mother Your Soda. To this rope I offer my humble obeisances. I offer my obeisances to your most beloved Srimati Radharani and to your unlimited pastimes. Hi Maharaj. So now we have the verse up on the screen. Yes. And if you'd like to lead us in chanting. Sure. All right. All set? <clears throat> yes. So, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So, uh, first we'll do the words without the Sunday, like separating the words as Prabhupada used to do, and then we'll chant the whole line. Adhyarhaniya Adhyarhaniya Asanam Asanam Astitam Astitam Param Param Pritam Pritam Chatu Chatu Shodasha Shodasha Pancha Pancha Shakti Veep Yuktam Yuktam Bagai Bagai Swai Swai Itaratra Itaratra Cha Adruvai Adruvai Vai Eva Eva Dhaman Dhaman Ramamanam so the whole line now? You know, Maharaj, yeah. I am sorry that echo is so bad. Oh. I can't possibly isolate it. I, I don't know what's going on here. Um, at this point, because of the echo, it might be better if I just mute everybody and you just go ahead, chant the verse, and do the translation, the first word, and you know that we're all listening in. Okay. Yeah, I, I just got it. So let me mute everybody. Just give me a moment. Sure. I'll tell you the cause of the echo. The cause of the echo is somebody has a microphone on and their speaker that is feeding back. So right, but uh, I don't know who that is. It could be anybody. There's a lot of people on the line. So let me just go ahead and mute everybody. Muted. Unmuted. So, Maharaj. Yes. I muted everybody except for you. Now only you can be heard. Okay. 
So I'll go ahead and uh, begin the class. Um, so, uh, one second. I'm just Actually, I'm reading the verse from uh, my uh, database thing here because I wanted to go back and give context. Okay. Adhyani asana masti tam param vritam chatuk shodasha pancha shakti vi yuktam bhagai sari taratra chadruvai sa eva dhaman ramamanam ishwaram. Prabhupada's translation. The Lord was seated on his throne, surrounded by different energies like the four, the sixteen, the five, and the six, natural opulences, along with other insignificant energies of the temporary character. But he was the factual Supreme Lord enjoying his own abode. Prabhupada's purport. The Lord is naturally endowed with his six opulences. Specifically, he is the richest, most powerful, most famous, most beautiful, greatest in knowledge, and the greatest renouncer as well. And for his material creative energies, he is served by four, namely the principles of Prakriti, Purusha, Mahatattva, and Ego. He is also served by the 16, namely the five elements, water, I'm sorry, earth, water, air, fire, and sky, the five perceptive sense organs, eye, ear, nose, tongue, and skin, and the five working sense organs, hand, leg, stomach, evacuation, outlet, and genitals, and the mind. The five includes... Uh, the sense objects, namely form, taste, smell, sound, and touch. All these 25 items serve the Lord in the material creation, and all of them are personally present to serve the Lord. The insignificant opulence is numbering eight. The Ashta Siddhis, attained by yogis for temporary overlordship, are also under his control, but he is naturally full with all such powers without any effort, and therefore he is the Supreme Lord. The living beings, by severe penance and performance of bodily exercises, can temporarily attain some wonderful power, but that does not make one the Supreme Lord. The, su the Supreme Lord, by his own potency, is unlimitedly more powerful than any yogi. He is unlimitedly more learned than any jnani. He is unlimitedly richer than any wealthy person, unlimitedly more beautiful than any beautiful living being, and unlimitedly more charitable than any philanthropist. He is above all. No one is equal to or greater than him, nor can anyone reach his level of perfection in any of the above powers by any amount of penance or yoga demonstrations. The yogis are dependent on his mercy. Out of his immensely charitable disposition, he can award some temporary powers to the yogis because of the yogis, uh, because of the yogis hankering after them but to his unalloyed devotees who do not want anything from the Lord save and accept his transcendental service, the Lord is so pleased that he gives himself in exchange for unalloyed service. Sita Prabhupada Ki Jai. So I would like to place this verse in context by briefly uh, talking about what comes before it. This is, of course, the second canto, chapter 9, text 17. So let's just take a minute to consider what leads up to this verse and what is really going on here in the Bhagavatam. So the, this chapter begins, this chapter which Prabhupada calls answers by citing the Lord's version because in the previous chapter there were many questions. So here... Um, it begins, Sri Sukhu Vacha Atmayam Rite Rajan Prasyanu Bhavatmana uh, interestingly, in this world, this world of ignorance, this world of illusion, uh, people are always wrestling with doubts, like, do you really believe in God? Do you really think there's a Krishna? At least the non-devotees say that. But from the point of view of enlightened souls, it's exactly the opposite. They're wondering, how in the world could people be that dumb in the material world? Like, how could they not get it? because Krishna's everywhere, so just as we have doubts about the spiritual world, they have doubts about us uh, in a different way. So this chapter begins by saying that um, without, if it were not for uh, the power of illusion, if it were not for the Lord's, the, the Supreme Soul's power of illusion, uh, there could not be material life that living beings could never really believe 
uh, that they were connected to material uh, goals or achievements or material values. And so the soul is compared to a one who has seen a dream. That when we look out at the world and, and don't see Krishna, we just see a tree, a house, someone else's body, our own face in a mirror. When we just look out at the world, we are like uh, sleeping people seeing a dream. And if it were not for the Lord's illusory energy, this wouldn't be possible. Because how could you see something that doesn't exist, namely a world without Krishna, unless there is some power of illusion, power of illusion that covers consciousness. So having said that, then Shuka Deva Goswami says that uh, for the soul who is thus dreaming, seeing this dream of material life, many forms appear, many bodies, many other living forms the form of jewelry, the form of a private yacht or an executive jet or a beautiful property or, or, or you know, the body of one so-called lover or luster or whatever. So Maya takes on many forms. Maya takes on many forms and appears in many ways and the living being is enjoying or trying to enjoy in these different modes of Maya and in this enjoying spirit, the soul develops the attitude of uh, mamaham. Everything is mine, or I would like to possess things, and I am the center of reality. So this is what's going on. However, uh, there is a loophole. There's a way out of this ignorant life. And first, the principle is going to be stated, and then Brahma is going to be given in the Bhagavatam here, and that, that leads up to the verse we're talking about, as an example of someone who actually does escape this illusion. So in text three of this chapter, it said that Jahi Vava Himni Sway Parasman, that when the soul is free of illusion and is able to enjoy in the soul's own glory. This is a this is a phrase which we find also in the first canto of the Bhagavatam, Himni Sway, in one's own real greatness, one's own glory. Because our glory is not to have a great material body or a very intellectual material body or beautiful or strong or famous or popular, whatever. That's not our real glory. That's just temporary and mechanical and it vanishes. So when we are able to enjoy in our own true glory, which is that we're part of God, our transcendental identity, which is beyond material time and illusion, then by giving up a uh, desire to enjoy this world and other material world or subtle and gross uh, aspects of illusion, then we literally, to use a term which Krishna also uses in the Gita, udaste, as means to sit in Sanskrit, and that's where you get the word asana, a seat. But also it means to sit, but also means to remain, like to stay and like to sit in a certain situation means to remain in that situation. So the word is used both ways. And ud means up or above. So udaste. Krishna uses the term in the Gita that one has to be udasina, literally sitting above or remaining above the fray, remaining above material interaction, material activities. So when one can give all that up, material life, and then remain above it all, then one can enjoy in one's own true greatness, or one mahimni sway, one's own glory. So then, uh, Brahma, in order to clarify or purify, the Bhagavatam says in text 4, the truth about the soul, the Lord spoke higher principles, spiritual principles, to Brahma, revealing to him, the Lord re was revealing to Brahma the Lord's own form. And the Lord revealed this to Brahma, and the verse we're, we're, we're studying today is part of that revelation. It's part of that revelation. So the Lord reveals his form to Brahma because Brahma was avyalika brita which literally means 
I, I'm, uh, actually, this refers to Krishna, that because Krishna was of Yalika, but he was honored by Brahma by a non duplicitous vow, vrata. And so, of course, Prabhupada required that we take a vow to, to be initiated. So, uh, to commit yourself to Krishna, you know, and, and regardless of whether we can, you know, how strictly we practice this or that, the ultimate vrata is that we really commit ourselves to Krishna. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, if you cannot follow strictly everything in Bhakti Yoga, at least work for me. Uh, uh, Param so really to, to be sworn to Krishna, to really devote yourself to Krishna to the best of your ability without duplicity and thus to honor Krishna by that sincere commitment, commitment uh, is what Brahma did. And therefore Krishna revealed his form to Brahma and then Brahma, who is himself the original demigod and the highest guru in, within the material world, he wanted to create, but he couldn't find the source of his existence, as Prabhupada translates that. He could not attain the vision he needed uh, by which he could, by which there could be a material creation. So I mean, that's in a sense, that's all of us. Uh, that, that situation of all of us because all of us uh, are trying to serve Prabhupada we are trying to fulfill Prabhupada's vision of making the world Krishna conscious and yet it's very hard to find the means to find the, the exact way to make this happen so in a sense we are in a similar situation to Brahma how do we carry out the creation that Prabhupada requested of us so Brahma meditates and then he hears two syllables, and, and then it's sort of a, uh, very interesting in the way he explains where these syllables are on the alphabet, so you can know what they are. And those two syllables are tapa, which can be the word tapa, austerity, but it also in Sanskrit is the command tapa. So what Brahma heard is also the command, perform austerity. So hearing that, he wanted to see who said it. You know, if you suddenly hear a voice in the sky, and like, who said that? Who goes there? So it says your Brahma wanted to see who said that, who said tapa. And he was looking all around, couldn't find anyone else. And so therefore he just sort of, Swadishnya Mastaya, means he kind of sat tight for the moment. And he began to meditate deeply on what was best for the world. And then he actually carried out the instruction, he fixed his mind in austerity. So he hears this command, tapa, perform austerity. And who said that? He's looking all around, can't find who said it, can't figure it out. So he thinks, well, I mean, basically, Brahma concludes, as they say, if everything else fails, follow the instructions. And so he says, decides, okay, I'll do it. I'll actually perform austerity. And then it said, for a thousand celestial years with unfailing vision, conquering his breathing and uh, his uh, action and knowledge acquiring senses, he performed austerities, which, which sort of uh, affected the whole world. They were so powerful, just like Dhruva did later in the fourth canto. And so, performing those austerities with full concentration, then the Lord, being thus worshipped by Brahma, revealed to him the Lord's own world, Swaloka. Krishna revealed his own world to Brahma, which is supreme, which has nothing above it which is uh, free of all sanklesha. Sanklesha is sort of a synonym of kunta, anxiety, trouble, misery, something we are all intimately acquainted with. And so in that higher world, you paid the sanklesha. All troubles are gone. All illusion is gone. There's no anxiety. And uh, the Lord there is being worshipped by enlightened beings. So then, uh, you know, it goes on to say there's no material, there's no material influence there of the modes of nature. No time cannot vanquish anyone. There's no illusion. And everyone there is anubrata. They are devoted to Krishna. They are committed to Krishna. The same word vrata. Just as it said that Krishna chose to reveal himself to Brahma because Brahma had performed sincere, non-duplicitous vrata. It committed himself to Krishna without duplicity. 
and thus honored the Lord. So here it said the residents of the spiritual world are also Anubrata. Anubrata, they are carefully following uh, their vows, their commitment to Krishna. And therefore, because they do that, they are honored by the suras and dasuras. It, it reminds me of that uh, famous line in the prayer to the six Goswamis where it says, Dira Dira Janapriyo, that they were, the six Goswamis were dear to the um, Dira, as, as Prabhupada said, the sober people and the Adhira, sort of the uh, out of control people. And so here it said that the residents of Vaikuntha, because they're Anubrata, because they, they very strictly follow their commitment to Krishna, therefore both gods and demons honor them. And then uh, there's a description of them, their beautiful spiritual bodies, that in, in uh, verses 11 and 12 of this chapter. And then it describes some of the features there, sort of Vaikuntha Airlines. There's all these beautiful glowing airships. This is better than any sci-fi movie you ever saw. All these beautiful glowing airships and there's uh, incredibly beautiful glowing women, etc. So some of the opulences of that wor world are described. And then of course the supreme female Sri herself, the goddess of fortune, Rupini, which means in, 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 a, in a beautiful form. Because Sri, as you know in Sanskrit, is used a lot just to mean fortune or opulence. Also, of course, always connected to the goddess herself. The word Sriman, as in Srimad Bhagavatam, or Sriman, which kind of means Mr. So-and-so in India. It literally means one who has Sri, a fortunate person. And so here it said that Sri is in, this, in that spiritual world, not merely in the abstract sense that there's fortune or beauty, but Sri herself with a spiritual body. So, so that emphasis is given there. Rupini, with a beautiful spiritual body. She's personally present there. Karoti Manam Bahuda. In many ways, she's literally doing honor. Literally, that's what it says. Literally, she does honor in many ways. To Krishna there, to the Supreme Lord. And uh, she's singing his praises, even as her praises are being sung. And then, Brahma saw that spiritual world. He saw Satvatam Patin. Patin means the master of Krishna, the master of his devotees. Shriyak Patin, the master of Sri. Yagya Patin, the master of sacrifice. Jagat Patin, the master of the universe. There with his personal associates who are serving him for he is the Almighty One. And then it's described how Krishna reciprocates by his loving glances with his devotees. And then we come to this verse. So the verse we're doing today is in that context. And so let's look at it again, the Sanskrit, and see how it fits in to everything that's come before. First of all, it said, Adhyarhani asanam. So all these words that end in M are in the accusative case in Sanskrit. They are the objects of the verb in the previous verse, the darsha, which means Brahma saw, the darsha. So all these words ending in M in this verse are, are Krishna, the object, in other words, the object that Brahma saw. So Arhana means uh, like honorable or worthy. And Arhaniya means like, like worthy, honorable. And Adhi means above or over. So Adhi Arhaniya means like most worthy or exceedingly, exceedingly worthy or exceedingly uh, magnificent Krishna's seat. Adhyarhani asanam asti param. The Lord was sitting there on, on that the supreme, on that supremely honorable, worthy, glorious seat. Britam. Uh, and surrounded by Chatuk Shodasha Pancha Shaktivi. The four, sixteen, and five potencies, literally. So, uh, do the math at 25, typical number of all the basic components of uh, reality, at least in this world. So what that means is that these potencies are, they're Krishna's potencies. The, the real point of this verse is to, um, of course, show the glories of God and to emphasize, as the Bhagavatam repeatedly does, monotheism. There's only one God. And things that aren't God aren't God. 
because there is a profound understanding in the Vedas that everything is ultimately one, in a sense, as Krishna says that in, in the Gita, that um, after many births, one who comes to knowledge understands Vasudeva Sarvam Iti, that Vasudeva is everything. But in the sense that, as Krishna says, Ahang Sarvasya Prabhava, and the source of everything. Arjuna himself says this in chapter 11, team. Uh, God, sorry, a little too much absorbed here in uh, theology and Sanskrit. In chapter 11 of the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says, um, I mean, sorry, Arjuna says, Sarvam Samapnoshi, Tatosi Sarvam. You are everything in the sense that you encompass everything or you complete everything. And so Krishna is everything, everything is one. But then in the Gita, Krishna explains, and Arjuna explains very carefully what that means. And it means that Krishna is the source of everything. Everything is within him and he's within everything. That's the sense that everything is one. But because impersonalism is kind of like endemic in this world, because after all, this is the world of the envious, those who don't like the idea of there being a supreme personality of Godhead, and therefore, uh, it's very, there, there's a chronic disease in this world where people take the oneness to be unqualified, absolute, we're just, it's just all one, there's no God above me, and so on. And so the Bhagavatam and Prabhupada go to great lengths to relieve people of this delusion. And so, uh, here also, all these powerful energies are just surrounding Krishna, or the Lord of Vaikuntha, so then yuktam uh, bhagai swire, because to be surrounded by these energies means that Krishna is actually, he's uh, endowed with his own opulences, his own energies. And then itarata chadruvai, itarata, itara in Sanskrit, I'll just be a little technical and then I'll uh, just hold your breath, we'll be past this very soon. Itara means the opposite of whatever comes before it. Like, for example, one way of saying demigods is asura itara, the opposite of asura, in other words, the demigods. And so here, itara tra, tra means location, like atra, here, tatra, there, yatra, where, or kutra, the question where. And so here, itara tra in another place, or in the opposite place. So, uh, we're talking about the spiritual world, so itara tra literally means somewhere else. In, in other words, in, in, a, in the material world, uh, you find the adruvai, the shaktis, which are not permanent. Which is interesting because present there are the 25, the 4, 16, and 5, which sound like material elements, but they're existing there in their pure eternal models, you could say, original forms, whereas the temporary uh, versions or the temporary replicas of these eternal forms are found elsewhere, itaratra, or in the opposite place, namely in the material world. So that's what that verse literally says. Yuktam bhagai, yukta means possessed, bhagai with his potencies, swire, his own potencies. So all these shaktis are Krishna's own uh, potencies, his own opulences, and then in, in the opposite place, the material world, itaratra, adruvai, he's endowed with the temporary potencies, the non-permanent, and then Swayiva Dhamnam, Dhamman, in his own abode, uh, Ramamanam Ishwaram. Again, these words end in M, Ramamanam and Ishwaram, because this is what Brahma saw. These are the objects, or the object of, of, of the action of Brahma seeing. So he saw the Lord, Ishwaram, enjoying Ramamanam, Swayiva Dhamni, only in his own abode. The word Eva is very interesting here. If you look at the last line of this verse, Swayiva, uh, which means in his alone. In other words, Krishna is not like someone has to mooch off other people. He's not homeless. Uh, he actually has his own abode. And it's very interesting because there's another popular delusion in this world, which is that uh, God simply lives within us or God is love, which means when I love, God becomes manifest through my love. But he doesn't have his own life. God is somehow contingent upon me and doesn't have any existence apart from my acts of loving or whatever. But God is everything, which means he's nothing, because anything which is everything is obviously nothing. Nothing in itself. And so here, 
Just like, for example, think back to the first verse of the Bhagavatam. Uh, Dhamna Swena, again, his own abode. Dhamna Swena, Sadan, Irasta Kuhakang, Satyang Parang Dhimati. Dhimati, I meditate upon that supreme truth, uh, who is ever free of deceit with his own abode. Dhamna Swena. And so here we have the same word, Swadhamma. Here in, in the locative form, Swaeva Dhamma. Brahma saw the Lord enjoying Ramamana, present participle. Of course, that's the verb Ram from which we get the word Rama, the source of pleasure. So he saw the Lord enjoying only in his own abode. So Krishna, that's one of Krishna's opulences. He's not dependent on anyone else. So um, a few words about, about this verse. What we're getting here is sort of an official portrait. And if you think of a king, a king has, well, there are a few kings left, but um, let's say a king or a queen or a president or a prime minister, uh, they're usually very busy people. But they do take official portraits. And when they take their official portraits, sometimes they'll be surrounded by their ministers, there'll be different emblems and symbols and, and you know, coat of arms, whatever. And they may be holding, for example, a king or a queen may hold a royal scepter or different other symbols of authority. And those are official portraits. And so that's exactly what we're getting here in a sense. I mean, Krishna is on a seat. Krishna is doing many, many things. He's not always just sitting down on a throne surrounded by his energy. So here we have sort of like this nice group shot, you could say, family shot, a royal, of the royal family. Krishna with uh, all his opulences and energies and so on. So as we know, uh, as Prabhupada explained, this is uh, the Lord of Vaikuntha. There is more formality, there is more um, reverence and solemnity. And one has to understand the authority of God before one can presume to uh, share intimacy with the Lord. In our own lives, we all experience this, that if someone wants to be intimate with us without having shown us a certain minimum appropriate amount of respect or consideration, the intimacy is actually very displeasing. It's, it's, um, it's like you feel like you're being violated. That someone just sort of uh, pushes himself on you or imposes or tries to impose on you an artificial relationship of intimacy. And so if you think of it, people who are themselves sort of mentally healthy or emotionally healthy, uh, the people with whom we share intimacy uh, you know, assuming it's not based on just some type of, um, I don't know, passionate attachment, because as we know, passionate attachments make us very irrational. So think of your relationships, which are not based on, I mean, hopefully no one, none of us have crazy attachments, but if you think of relationships which are reasonable, in which we have not because of being driven uh, driven by a mad attachment, but just acting as mature adults, we have chosen to accept a close friendship with someone that we really care about and that cares about us. And so when those friendships or relationships, or, you know, whatever rasa they are, when they work, when they are um, successful and, and sustainable, it's because there's a mutual respect. It's just like in marriage or any type of... Uh, intimate friendship, uh, there has to be mutual respect. And it's precisely the mutual respect which makes possible the intimacy. For example, by Prabhupada's mercy, uh, Prabhupada taught us basically how to be human beings and, um, and then how to be devotees of Krishna. And so we can, let's say, be in a room where there are men and women and uh, there's no danger. Why? Because everyone uh, has learned how to show proper respect, first of all, to God, 
to the guru, to, uh, to each other. And so, as they say, good fences make good neighbors. And so Dharma is like, like, like this. It, it, it's there. Dharma is a type of boundary. In fact, there's a word in Sanskrit, uh, Maryada, which is still used in India, Hindi, and so on, other languages. Maryada means a, a, a boundary or a limit or a, a um, protocol, an ethic. So that, for example, when uh, Vidura approached Udava and said, please talk to me about Krishna, and Udava, I believe it was, said that actually Maitreya Muni is here, and so uh, he didn't want to commit Maryada Vyatikrama, which means that sort of over, overstepping the boundaries, uh, ethical boundaries, and so on. So, um, so Dharma is like that. Dharma actually defines what are the proper boundaries, uh, the parameters, the uh, and so on. And so, uh, to follow Dharma is to follow is, is to respect those natural boundaries. And I say, good fences make good neighbors. So we are free. Those who follow Prabhupada, we are free to intimately associate with each other, to form uh, rewarding friendships. Why? Because we know what Dharma is, we, we, and, and especially Vaishnava Dharma. And so it makes us free. Intimacy is safe in a situation where people know the boundaries and respect them, and respect each other. And so um, here, the Bhagavatam, which ultimately is going to teach us about Krishna and his intimate pastimes with the gopis and his coward boyfriends and his, his parents and so on and others, first teaches us about Vaikuntha. Why? Because unless we learn to respect Krishna, unless we understand his position as God, our so-called intimacy with him will simply be a, a violation, an offense. It will be most displeasing to the Lord and basically disgusting. And so even Prabhupada said that in deity worship there's a formality and there's opulence so that, uh, not, not so that we remain on that platform, but so that we internalize and really, uh, so we really internalize and, 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 and realize uh, that natural respect which is due to God and then it makes us free to share intimacy with him and that's true in our own relationships and uh, we find in the uh, we find in the Bhagavatam for example that whenever Krishna met the Pandavas he very strictly followed the Maryada he very strictly followed the etiquette in the sense that he would always Krishna we're talking about Krishna here he would bow to Yudhisthir and Bhima. Why? Because they were older. How much older? Yudhisthir was two years older. Bhima was one year older than him. They were cousin brothers. Uh, Bhima was one year older, yet Krishna would always bow to him. Krishna would embrace Arjuna. They were the same age. And Krishna would receive the obeisances of Nakula and Sahadev, the twins, because they were a year younger. And so... Uh, not that I'm saying we all have to constantly bow to each other every second, but and 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 but that was the first time Krishna. We don't hear about Krishna, for example, bowing to Bhima and Yudhishthir every day or all the time. But they hadn't seen each other for months, and so it was it was a way of uh, offering that respect when they first met after months. So, um, and then we see the great intimacy among them. So, so this formality, the structure, it doesn't destroy intimacy. Sometimes, like nowadays in modern culture, people attack all kinds of formality and all kinds of dignity, and we live basically in a quite a barbarian, ape-like age. And uh, in which people are furious that there's any attempt to restrain public indecency. What people don't understand is that it is this deep respect, that, that this uh, type of formality, because you think the word formality means respecting forms. There are real structures in nature. 
There are real structures in the world. There are real hierarchies. And there are false hierarchies, of course, such as the one, you know, if someone has a lot of money, they're an important person. But, but apart from all the false hierarchies, there are real hierarchies that have structure, that have form. And so formality means to honor the natural form of things. And we do this through etiquette. And when we do it, if it's done properly in Krishna consciousness, formality does not keep us apart like stiff and cold. Formality does not keep us apart if done right. It does the opposite. It actually brings us close together because it makes it safe for people of different genders, of different ages, of different levels of spiritual advancement. Advancement, it makes it safe for all kinds of people to share intimacy because that intimacy is based on a genuine respect for and recognition of natural and significant hierarchies and uh, and also significant dangers for example when men and women uh, associate together there is some danger just because of the way the world is created and so therefore the solution is not that they are you know just separated in some cold way but actually there is a culture which allows men and women to be friends to associate to be part of the same spiritual family so formality of course people don't understand this people who are still somewhat in the bodily concept of life even if they are in you know sannyasa order of life or whatever they may be uh, they don't understand that formality is meant to promote intimacy not to annihilate it and therefore they think that the separation of different groups of people is just because different groups of people are different and should be kept apart. According to Bhagavad Gita 1821, that is a symptom of somewhere in the mode of passion. That, however, in the mode of goodness, one sees that the differences between people are superficially, are superficial in the literal sense of the word, superficie in Latin means the surface, that on the surface we are different, different ages, different genders, different this, different that. But that's a surface, and beneath the surface, we are all one. We are all eternal souls. And therefore, someone who actually has come to the point of goodness, or spiritual goodness, understands that structure, formality, is actually meant to promote intimacy, to make it safe, not to destroy it. So here, we have this formality in relation to Krishna, so that we can get to the tenth canto and deal with it in the proper way. So, that, I think, is what I had to say. So, uh, do we take questions, or what happens next? Really, last one, Raj. Oh, it's a pleasure. Yes. Uh, I'm going to unmute everybody, and uh, then we can open up for a question. Hey, Narahari Prabhu. It's a pleasure to, pleasure to hear from you. That's great to have you so much. Ramana, there's an echo. Can you stop that echo so much? It's hard to hear. I don't know. We're trying to figure out where that's coming from. Uh, okay, if I feel very good. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Okay, maybe that was it. Let's see if this works. Oh, well, sounds good. Okay, so, um, gosh, you've covered so many points, I almost don't know where to start with a question, so I, mean, I want to go back to the, the beginning of your talk, when you were speaking about how, from, a, from an absolute perspective, from an enlightened perspective, it, it's ludicrous that we could be so conditioned in this material world and accept all of these modes of nature, these bodies and relationships as, as actual reality. But of course, we know that Krishna tells us in the Bhagavad Gita, this is Krishna's divine eluding potency. But then you gave us the secret. You said there, there's, there's a loophole. And that loophole you were talking about uh, that, that Brahma executed by following Tapasya. And so we're also given that by our spiritual master, directly, but, um, but Prabhupada. In, uh, as Brahma very diligently executed and absorbed himself in his meditation. My question is, is that as we follow 
the instructions of a guru and execute these principles, which some of us have done for over 40 years. And we're actually doing it. We're actually chanting 16 rounds, following the principles, chanting our dietaries, trying to support us. How do we keep it from becoming mechanical? Because we're, we're warned by Rupa Goswami that, um, that this uh, uh, Niyamagraha can, can very much impede or destroy our devotional service. So how do we keep it from becoming mechanical and it actually be from our heart where it really should be? Excellent question. Uh, I think, yeah, it's interesting because as you know, in this world, whenever we practice anything, whether it's a musical instrument, a particular athletics, like a sport, or, you know, working in a certain way, when people practice enough, they say, yeah, I can do that in my sleep. And so literally we get to the point where we kind of do bhakti yoga in our sleep. And, and so it's interesting, the practice of anything, and it's in, because the word sadhana, which, you know, practice, like sadhana bhakti, uh, is a more recent Sanskrit word, or, or used, let's say, in the last many centuries to mean like practice. But if you look back to the Gita, the word they use for practice uh, is not sadhana, it's abhyasa. As in chapter 12, where Krishna says that if you cannot sort of spontaneously uh, just love me, then do abhyasa yoga, which means practice, like sadhana bhakti. But the word abhyasa also means repetition. So to practice something is repeated, but as we know, when you practice, it's a double-edged sword because you get really good at something, but you also literally can do it in your sleep and often do it in your sleep. And so, as you were asking that question, I think the end, there's a simple solution. And that is, we must um, envision fulfilling Prabhupada's desires to save this planet as part of our sadhana. We, as you say, we chant 16 rounds, we, we follow the four principles, and we, you know, we do kirtan and so on, arti. So, those things you can sort of quote-unquote master or do in your sleep. But what we cannot do in our sleep, and what always keeps us honest and keeps us struggling and praying, is that when we actually feel responsible to carry out Prabhupada's desires. Because as we know, if we look around the world right now, the Western world, uh, we're not winning. And, and I, th I think there's actually, I was talking to Brahmachirtha about this yesterday, I think there's a very popular misunderstanding which is sort of making us more, I mean, making the movement a little more dull than it would be otherwise. And that is the belief that ultimately a Gyata Sukriti can do it all. And by a Gyata Sukriti, of course, a Gyata, unknown, and a Sukriti, good deed. Unknown good deed, a Gyata Sukriti. You know, like those stories in the Puranas where a hunter accidentally fasts on a codice and, you know, goes to Vaikuntha or Migwaran Harinam and, and people, just because they hear it, they're becoming purified. Now, that's true. It, it, I'm not saying that it's not true. But if you look at what Krishna says in chapter 17 of the Gita, the last verse in chapter 17, text 28, he says, Ashadhyahutam <laughs> that any religious activity, any religious activity which is done without faith has very little effect in this life or the next. And so even though people can be and are, people are purified if they touch Prabhupada's book, if they hear the holy name, of course there is purification. But it's not the kind of purification or not the amount of purification that will allow us to create a very powerful world religion. In fact, if you look at the stories in, in, in the Shastras, that kind of a Gyata Sukriti, it's always something extra, something added on, like, okay, you have a Vedic civilization going on, and then one lucky individual, or, or because of their previous activities. So, we cannot simply rely on a Gyata Sukriti and prophecies, like someday the prophecies will come true. I'm not saying they won't come true, 
But Prabhupada indicated at the very end of his life, he indicated very clearly, it, it's not mechanical. You brought the point of Rupa Goswami. There's not only a type of mechanical sadhana where Rupa Goswami says will cause a fall down, where you think it's automatic. I just, you know, do these things and I'll automatically become a pure devotee. And Rupa Goswami says no. But there's also, I think, a type of automatic Sankirtan movement where all you have to do is just go out on the street and chant whether people like it or not, whether they chant with, you know, just it, the public response doesn't matter. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to worry about proper time and place. What kind of music will attract them? I mean, think if, if you if you went to a, let's say if you're a devotee, you open a restaurant, you got to think about those things. What's the right location? What's the right what's the right recipe? What's the right price? So prasadam is spiritual, just like the holy name is spiritual. Prasadam is also Krishna, and yet there has to be intelligence. So I think that if we take the Sankirtan movement off of automatic pilot where we think that if we just do certain things, automatically the world will be saved, because what's happening now is, it's not happening. It's not happening. The Hare Krishna movement in the Western world is just, is just a shadow of what it was when Prabhupada was here. I used to sit, you know, I sat at Prabhupada's feet in Honolulu, actually, where this call is originating, and in Los Angeles. Many times I sat at Prabhupada's feet when he arrived uh, into America and from another country, and then there was the press conference. And he always said the same thing. Prabhupada had this, like this uh, amazing discipline where he would always be on message. So when he would come into America and have a press conference, he would always say this. He would say to the reporters that, um, pointing to us, sitting at his feet, these are American boys and girls. I have not imported them from India. When Prabhupada, when Bhagavan sent Prabhupada a big glossy picture of the uh, new chateau, castle they had rented or purchased in Geneva, uh, I know because Prabhupada was, I was hosting Prabhupada in Caracas when he received that letter. And I saw it, and I saw the picture. And Prabhupada wrote back and said, That's a, you know, it's very nice, but there, there was a, it was a group shot in front of the chateau was, were all these devotees sitting there. And Prabhupada said, are those local devotees? Or did you bring them from somewhere else? We want to work with local people. We want to make local devotees. And so, uh, just as if you put your personal sadhana on automatic pilot, Rupa Goswami says, it won't work. It also doesn't work when you put the Sankirtan movement on automatic pilot and think we can ignore the non-devotees, we can ignore their taste, their preference, their, their needs, and we just show up and do something and automatically they'll be purified. And so if we feel responsible, like I personally, every one of us, I am personally responsible to Prabhupada to try to fulfill his desires of a powerful Western Hare Krishna movement, then there's no question of automatic because it's a struggle. It is not, as you know, it is very, very hard. Getting up, Chatting you around, sure, you can do that without too much trouble. But saving America, which Prabhupada said is essential for his movement to work, saving America, that, you see, that's going to really give us a challenge. That's going to really challenge us. And so if we feel, well, I can't do it, what can I do? It's beyond me, who am I? Then we give ourselves the luxury, frankly, the kind of the... Uh, debilitating so-called luxury of just not doing that much. But if we take the Sankirtan movement off automatic pilot and feel personally responsible, we're going to suddenly be right back in the battlefield again fighting. And there'll be no question of, of, of you know, dullness. Thank you. Very nice answer. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Well, uh, Maharaj, uh, thank you for your class. That was wonderful. This is Mahesh from the Big Island. Oh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, don't you think that in Hare Krishna, what you were just saying, I think that was very thoughtful of you, uh, and we do need to revive this movement. Don't you think that what we need now is small communities and bring back the Russian Dharma? Don't you think that Prabhupada would really like that? 
establishes small communities where the voice can be trained properly, led by, led by the senior devotees, actually. What do oh, you think? Okay, thank you for that question. A few things occur to me. Um, number one, we sort of do the ashrams already. You know, householder, brahmachari, sannyasi, we, a lot of devotees really have accepted an ashram. The real problem is the varnas. And um, the problem with the varnas is, is that they are based on, they sort of depend on an agrarian economy, a land-based economy. And that's why, if you look at Prabhupada's Varnashram discussions in 1974 in Vrindavan, at the same time, he says that um, we should reinstitute the Varnas. He also says we need to buy land and start farms. That's when the ISKCON Back to Nature movement started in 1974. So, uh, in industrial and post-industrial society, uh, it's difficult. For example, let's say you're a Brahmin by nature. And yet to work as a teacher, let's say you have a family to maintain. You have to be an employee, you have to get a job, and yet an employee is a sudra, but a teacher is a Brahmin. So in, in the industrial and post-industrial world, everything is just completely a mess. If we had a larger ISKCON society, let's say, for example, the Hare Krishna movement was actually succeeding in, a, in the Western world, which it's not as a Western movement. We attract a lot of people from the Indian background. But in terms of making a lot of Western devotees, we don't do that anymore. So let's say we did. Let's say we fixed that. Let's say we had hundreds and thousands of Western devotees. Then you could actually start, then you could get a small-scale Varna community because you have to have enough people, for example, in order to pay a teacher. Like, let's say you start a school, you have to have so many students in order to um, make it economically feasible. Or let's say if you protect cows and, and you do sort of the classic Vaisha Dharma trade or cow protection, you have to have a lot of the land because everything nowadays, the modern economy, the cost of land, the cost of veterinarians, fencing, feed, everything, uh, 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 you know, labor, the cost of everything is, is calibrated on the assumption that you kill the cows and the bulls. And so if you don't kill the cows and the bulls, it's, um, you're sort of going against the current of the, of, of the economy you're living in. And that's why we have all these adopt the cow programs, is to try to offset the fact that the economy is based on the assumption that you don't protect cows. And so again, to do all these things like Varna's, uh, we really need to, you need, you need a, a society of scale. You have to have enough devotees because, because, I mean, sociologically, if, if you look at communities, the smaller the community, the more everybody does everything. For example, let's say a householder couple or two brahmacharis open up a preaching center like we used to when Prabhupada was here. Okay, there's two people. Everyone's a pujari, everyone's a cook, everyone's on Sankirtan, everyone does temple cleanup, everyone does everything. Let's say you, say you make a few more devotees. Okay, maybe one person stays back. Maybe three people go out. Let's say you have ten devotees. Okay, now you have a full-time pujari and cook. Now you may have someone that's a treasurer. Or, and, and, and so it's just, it's just the laws of nature that the more people you have in a society, the more uh, specialization you have. And that's why the big revolution, you could say, in human development is the agrarian economy because you can store grains. If you're a hunter and gatherer, you know, you can't store that. You have to keep moving. But when you can store large quantities of grain, you can support a more, much larger society. Then you could have all kinds of specializations. You begin to develop expertise, mastery in all kinds of arts and crafts, political science, this, that. You start to have full-time scholars, and so on. So one thing is, is just the question of size. And, 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 and how do we get there? If you go back to what Prabhupada said, that famous statement Prabhupada made in 1977, where he said that um, he wanted to go back to America, he said, I finished half my mission, now I want to complete it with, with the Varnasha. The problem is that in the meantime, the first half collapsed. It's not there anymore. Prabhupada made that statement when we had temples everywhere, the temples were full of 
people from that country, like for example, American temples were filled with Native Americans. Well, I don't mean Native, I don't mean like indigenous people, but and and we were making devotees, and therefore Prabhupada said, now that this is done, let's do the other half. But the first half collapsed. And so to do the second half, and, and so if you take it structurally, thinking now like, like a builder, an engineer, that the second half is built on top of the first half, when the first half collapses, when the foundation's not there, how do you do the superstructure when the foundation's gone? And, and, and so, again, when you have hundreds and thousands, of, let's say we had hundreds and thousands of young devotees in America, then you can say, okay, let, let's take 20 people and just do a, a, a Varna community here, or 30, 40 people. So I think that uh, in terms of, like when you're building something, you've got to first build this part and that part in terms of community of scale. I think for various reasons, I mean, it's not that I wouldn't like to have Varna, Varnashram communities. I'd like to have them now. I just don't think, I just don't think it's going to happen until uh, we actually get the preaching going, structurally. Rish, why do you think that the growth in America just kind of ran out of gas? Oh, I think it's easy to analyze. Here, here's my standard list of reasons. One thing is that um, America changed. There was a, you know, Krishna opened this historical window for Prabhupada in the um, late 60s, mid to late 60s, and then very early 70s, where there was a huge Eastern mystique, an Indian mystique, gurus and everything. People wanted to go back to nature. They wanted to join utopian communities, spiritual communities. So it was a unique historical time. And that historical window is closed and is now sort of nailed shut. And so one of the problems is that, that a very large portion of the Hare Krishna movement in the West is preaching to a world that stopped existing 40 years ago. So, when you, so th th that's one major problem. Another problem is that ISKCON from the very beginning, I mean, at least I joined in 69, so not the very, but you know, pretty early on, uh, there was a lot of focus on money. I remember that. I mean, it was, it, you know, it's like, I mean, some, you know, are, frankly, from the very beginning, or, or not the very beginning, but let's say from about 1970 on, 71, the second month Maha Mantra was that Beatles song, you know, give me, give me money, it's what I want. And so, I remember it became so, ISKCON became so much based on like going out in the street, selling incense, collecting. The Prabhupada intervened. Prabhupada actually intervened in 1970 when, when the, the, there was that trouble with the four sannyasis in um, New Vrindavan. Prabhupada made sort of like this thorough uh, diagnostic, you know, of ISKCON. He said, there, you know, that there's really a deep-rooted problem here. And so, he made some comments about don't just try to get money, you should try to preach. And so then we went through a period where we went bankrupt because everyone went to the other extreme. But then it was like incense, selling incense, selling candles, selling bad rock and roll records, selling paintings. And then frankly, in two, two things happened in the, uh, let's say in the late 70s. One is, that the Western world just changed. People stopped joining movements like ours. And number two, uh, ISKCON went through so many internal problems, and so temple economies were collapsing, and then ISKCON discovered the ultimate paraphernalia. It wasn't incense or the candle or the rock and roll records or the paintings. The ultimate paraphernalia was the Hindu. And so basically, ISKCON reinvented itself in order to be pleasing to people. And, and at the same time, uh, U.S. immigration law changed, and um, suddenly huge numbers of Indians start coming. And so it was, like, it was like the perfect storm or the perfect thing where you get huge numbers of Indians coming to America. The old, temp the old temple economy was that you make lots of young devotees and send them out in the street to sell something, whether it's a book or incense or this or that. You make young devotees and send them out to sell things on the street. That was 
the economy of the Hare Krishna movement. And that collapsed. The world changed and, and ISKCON changed. That collapsed. And, and so the new economy became developing Hindu congregations and, and getting money from them. And that became the ISKCON economy. And you know, Karl Marx, who was a, a good historian, a terrible prophet, but a good historian, and that was his point, that, that the economic system tends to determine the political and cultural and social reality. And so when, when, when the ISKCON economy in the Western world became almost exclusively based on cultivating Indian congregational members, uh, ISKCON temples reinvented themselves as Hindu-friendly institutions. And when that happened, Western people who were already not so inclined to join communities like that anyway, you know, it wasn't for them anymore. And so because ISKCON really, I mean, ISKCON has really, if I was just a sociologist, if I was a historian, just looked at ISKCON in America, I would say that basically it's an Indian movement with some nice Western e outreach programs here and there. A few, a few nice, a few nice Western outreach programs, basically an Indian movement. And so there's no way in the world that movement is going to attract Western people. It's just not going to happen. So don't hold your breath. So what's really needed, in my view, as I mean, as a historian, as just having studied all these things, that we what we really need, and what we actually don't have, is a Western Hare Krishna movement. And I don't mean to go outside of this con. I am, you know, I am loyal to Prabhupada, and I always will be because I owe, I, owe, I owe him that and much more. So I'm working within Prabhupada's institution. But within ISKCON, there has to be a Western Hare Krishna movement. Not just a program here or there, not just a prasadam program here, not just a program for yoga teachers there, but an actual Western Hare Krishna movement, which we do not have at the present time. And that's why the Bhakti Yamta... So anyway, that's my that's the short version of it. Great answer. Krishna. Dhanavats, uh, uh, Who's this? Uh, this is Vita Dhanavats from Hawaii. Oh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I get an echo, Ramananda, can you take care of it? Yeah, I was trying to meet people, but I had muted before, sorry. I'll, I'll get them. Okay. Uh, I, I'd like to set something up here that's going to take a few lines, but uh, I do have a question. Some years ago, the American Broadcasting Corporation, ABC, did a barber. Hello? Barbie, like, Can you see? Okay, ABC did a, a Barbara Walter special called Heaven, What It Is and How to Get There. And so the producers and Walters went all over the world and talked with reps of major religions, including a Catholic priest, two Protestant ministers, uh, Jewish rabbis and scholars, Muslim scholars, even a jihadist in prison in Israel. And it culminated kind of in the interview with the Dalai Lama. So in other words, they represented most of the world, all world religions that have a view in heaven and asked them about this. But Hinduism was left out. Major world religion was left out. So I thought about this. And the very religion that had the most information and clarity on the heavenly planets was not included. So I was thinking how this happened, and it came to who are you going to call? Because Hinduism is an apparent hodgepodge and a conundrum for the West. But it also occurred to me that it's partly our failure to communicate Sanatana Dharma and Vaishnavism as the predominating, the predominant faith, at least 70 to 100 years ago in India. And we lack books outside of Prabhupada's books to introduce people to uh, what this is. Yes. Is that, I'm sorry, you still want, you want to go on? That's basically it. Okay. Very interesting point. Um, I think you're right that who do you talk to? I think there's another factor also, and that is consider the world religions. Um, Islam, Buddhism, of course, 
You could say the West was originally Christian. It's still the main religion in the West, some form of Christianity. Buddhism is spreading a lot among Western people. And Islam is growing in the West and is obviously extremely important in terms of world geopolitical events. And Judaism. I mean, Jews are a very are an important part of Western culture for various reasons. Hinduism, on the other hand, in a sense, it, you see, it doesn't fit any of those categories. It's not the original religion of the West. It's not that important in geopolitical events because India is, you know, tries to be very secular and India doesn't it just doesn't bother the world, and so therefore it's just it's just not in the news. It's not really India is just about India. They just want to develop their own economy. They're not really India doesn't get involved much in world affairs, and Hinduism, frankly, and also Indian. Sorry, and Indians themselves don't preach. In fact, they're almost like proud of not preaching, and so they don't fit anywhere. I mean, I mean, they don't. They're they're not original. They're not, they don't preach, and frankly, we don't either very much anymore to Western people. And, um, and they're not really very prominent in geopolitical events, and so where do they fit in? So it, they're kind of easy to forget. And it's interesting to see, like, like take Buddhism, for example. There are really two Buddhisms in America. And uh, one Buddhism is the fact that there are many immigrants in America that, for example, from Japan. There are many Japanese Americans, especially on the West Coast, or Chinese Americans, and uh, Buddhism is just their family religion. So therefore, up and down, I mean, certainly in, in Hawaii, I mean, especially in Hawaii. In Hawaii, even more so in Hawaii, and then up and down the, the Pacific, the West Coast, there's all these Buddhist temples, which are just family churches or temples for people who are born Buddhist. And what's interesting is, Western people don't go very much to those places. Those are for Japanese American, Chinese American families. And yet there's a whole other Buddhism, you know, the one hand clapping stuff and the Dalai Lama and all that. And that's a different Buddhism. That's for Western people. Now, if you look at the Hindu side, there used to be two Hinduisms, you know, roughly, I'm using these words very roughly. There used to be two Hinduisms in America. There was Hindus, just Hindu immigrants. This is the religion they were born in, and they build their mandirs, and they just, you know, that's just their family religion. Exactly, sociologically, exactly equivalent to Japanese American Buddhist temples on the West Coast or Hawaii. There used to be another form of quote-unquote Hinduism, which was a Western, preaching, growing Hare Krishna movement. The problem is that that preaching, growing Hare Krishna movement, which roughly was equivalent to Western Buddhism, collapsed. And it sort of merged back into the Indian community. And so now in America, probably at least half or more of the temple presidents in America come from an Indian background. Uh, probably 90% of ISKCON congregations come from, you know, Indian backgrounds. I mean, think about it. If you hear that some Methodist church or some Catholic church or some synagogue has 90% people from a certain background, it's their church. So, in a sense, there's only one Hinduism in America, and it's for Hindus. It's for people who are born in it. And, as I said, there is no Western Hare Krishna movement in this country. There are a few very nice projects, like in Gainesville, or perhaps you could say in Manhattan, you know, that project, or, or um, you know, other things as well. Charlottesville, Virginia, a nice little program. So there are nice programs, but there isn't a Western Hare Krishna, there isn't a Western Hinduism. There's only the immigrant Indian family thing and ISKCON has been very much assimilated into that. And if you don't believe it, just go to any ISKCON, you know, just go to the website of any ISKCON temple in a big American city. So th that's the situation we're in. 
So, uh, correct that. We need to, well, what I'm doing is, I mean, despite all my limitations and defects and all that, I am trying to convince you and everybody else I talk to to join an alliance where we recreate a Western Hare Krishna movement. And to do that, it means the first thing you need to know is that you're, it's not 1971 or 1972 or 1968. I mean, the first thing you actually have to look at a calendar and see what the year is. And, and then we have to understand that in, in, in the modern age, freaky is not positive. Those of us who came out of the 60s, you know, freaky, exotic, weird was a positive. Like to call somebody a freak was to flatter them. It's not like that nowadays. And so I, I, th I think the biggest impediment, I think the biggest impediment to having a Western Hare Krishna movement is what I call the myth of Vedic culture. And I, by that I don't mean that there is no Vedic culture. What I mean is that, that I, I believe we confuse ethnicity. Ethnicity. Like when you think, for example, let's say we talk about uh, native Hawaiian culture or Oaxacan culture or Bavarian culture or Watusi culture. It, what it means is a traditional form of cooking, of dressing, folk dances, folk music, architecture, in other words, an ethnicity. And so when we hear Vedic culture, devotees are actually thinking that there is a divine, absolute, eternal, ethnic tradition. So there's an eternal way to dress, there's an eternal way to cook and dance, and, and basically it, it precisely corresponds to Muslim-dominated North India, you know, in, in, the last few, in the last several hundred years. So if you read the Bhagavatam, I don't find anywhere in the Bhagavatam that there's any concern whatsoever with regulating or, or, or even saying there is such a thing as Vedic architecture, Vedic cuisine, Vedic dress, Vedic dance. What I find in the Bhagavatam is not ethnic details, but cultural principles. Cultural principles. For example, food. Krishna doesn't say in the Gita, offer me Indian cooking, offer me curries. What Krishna says in the Gita is, offer me food in the mode of goodness. In other words, you take food in the mode of goodness, sattva bhojana, you offer it to Krishna, it becomes shuddha sattva, which is spiritual. Rather than teach a spiritual science, we are teaching an ethnic tradition. And I think that, uh, I mean, do the math. You know, you can look this up, you can investigate this. Why don't you, you know, here's an example. How many songs a day do people download in the United States? It must be millions. How many of those songs, how much music that's downloaded every day in America is non-Indians buying Indian music? What percentage of the market is that? How many non-Indians go to Bharatanatyam dances where they just go voluntarily and have to pay for it? Indian restaurants are all over, and people like it, but what percentage, like, like if, you take, if you take the average American, how many times a week does he eat Indian food? And so basically, we are trying to force upon the Western world an ethnic, an ethnic tradition that they simply don't want. They don't want it, and we keep trying to force it on them with our Festival of India. And so why not give people what Prabhupada said we should? You know, the last time I went to Honolulu Temple, they had on their bulletin board this article from Prabhupada where he said, just add Krishna to your life. Why not let Western people just add Krishna to their life? Why not have a movement where they can just become devotees of Krishna without having to become ethnically Indian? And, you know, history shows every new religious movement that became a big world religion did that. There's no case in history where a religious movement became a world religion and didn't do that. That's how the Jesus movement became a world religion, Christianity. That's how every movement spread, Buddhism. So we are trying to defy the laws of nature. 
And every time ISKCON does that, it loses. It's like saying that, okay, we don't have to eat healthy food because it's offered to Krishna, it's prasadam. And how many Prabhupada disciples died prematurely because they thought they could defy the laws of nature? So this is social science. You know, social scientists who are friends of the movement, they give the Hare Krishna movement as a very clear example of, of a movement that failed. It failed in its goal to become a big movement in the West because it, 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 it could not integrate itself sufficiently with society. So I believe as a historian that until we do that, there's not, it's just, you know, forget it. Maharaj, there is a fantastic analysis of what you just said is, you hit it right on the nail. It's, it's exactly what is going on. I think uh, unification and uh, the races is say like, the problems you're talking about, we are doing it here. My wife and myself, we live in this little town in Hawaii. And we have many people, many followers that are Western. And they love our music. And my wife plays harp. You know, harp is a Western instrument. I play the Bansuri flute. What is, what is your name? Mahesh. Oh, Mahesh. It's still Mahesh. Hare Krishna. CC. I've I, I, I been around for many, many years around this movement. And anyway, we play exactly that kind of music that Westerners love to hear, but we, uh, we chant. We chant our chants. We sang music. And so we are doing this, and we have. So many people that come to our concerts, like this Sunday, I'm going to be speaking at the New Thought Center on Diwali and the Ramayan. But you know, the fact is that we need help. We need support and we need devotees, uh, understanding and support. And without that, I'm going to form an alliance of people helping each other. We're not going to go very far. Because without sadhana, without true preaching, without cooperation with other devotees, you you know, it's like we do all of these things and that's nice, but, you know, how far can we go anyway? You know, you, you have to have an alliance with other devotees in order to go any farther. So one thing that I would suggest, like we had here, Urmila Devi Dasi came recently, came on to one of our programs and, and we did it with her. And, and it was a fantastic program, really fantastic. But you really need more of those. You need practically every day or every week to have something like that to influence the Western mind. Um, and also I have some interesting ideas as to where we could go farther, but I think we cannot go anywhere without the association of the bodies and without working with other the bodies. And one thing I'm su I suggesting that I have is that if you ever come to Hawaii, please come and visit us. We need some help. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, it's great what you're doing. And um, I think that's it. If all of us in America who understand the need for you know, uh, Western, real Western outreach, and of course, following Prabhupada, following our principles, but Western outreach, if we all actually do form an alliance, we can have a very powerful thing, because in unity there's strength. So thank you very much, and, and maybe we'll talk I later. Should, yes, I please. Should. Yes, please. Pranam Maharaj, this is Gandhari from UK. Oh, Hare Krishna. I want to thank you. Thank you very much for your analytical viewpoints here. Uh, I just wanted to illustrate with a couple examples. Um, here we have a few Christians which are from South India. Yes. And uh, and of course now I know that there are 24 hour TV of Christian television programs uh, on and on going on 24 hour in Canada. And most of them are with uh, um, converted Punjabis. So this is what the Christians do, and this is what is illustrating what you are just saying, that uh, the Christians, when they convert, they don't meant uh, at all with their culture. So here, I'm associated with this South Indian neighbor, and it's amazing how strict they are in their culture, but their religion is completely uh, like blinded Christianity, you know? Yes, yes. That they are the correct ones. So, uh, yes, that is the illustration of what you were analyzing. I have another quick point. Yes. Um, you know, like, it is a big epidemic in East where it's, calling, it's been called Hinduization, 
and they blame the temple president, they blame uh, most general devotees, they blame uh, the leaders, the temple presidents, and the temple authorities for that forfeit. But uh, it would be good if somebody like yourself can <laughs> write a, a paper showing that actually um, those people, which uh, the Hindus or came from, according to the social, uh, uh, whatever, geo-social reasons that they came, they're losing their children to the Western culture, and here is ISKCON, which they see uh, very much open to share. So that is one of the reasons I saw that so many Hindus come forward, because first 10 years they were watching, you know, from 69 to 79 they were watching, and there was this Hindi movie called Hare Krishna, Hare Ram, and Devanand, who was the director, completely put down ISKCON by saying that ISKCON or Hare Krishna movement is only drugs and drinking. So that's why the Hindus were cautioned at that time for 10 years. After that, when they were started to lose their children, that's when they can realize that, okay, now we should come forward. But the real point which I want to make is that actually, after understanding here in classes, they are taking up Lord Chaitanya's movement, and that is why the number is increasing. It's the like attracts like, so the Hindus are bringing their families, they are bringing their relatives, like suppose if somebody gives a feast, they can easily invite 500 members of friends, relatives, families yes. to a feast. You see? Yeah, yeah, no, I think, yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate your saying that because I do want to make very clear that I'm not in any way criticizing and much less blaming the Indian devotees. I mean, the opposite, as you say, they, they are great souls. They're Vaishnavas, they're part of our spiritual family. So, there's, abs there's not only is there no fault. No, no, I'm not defending. I'm no, 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 defending. I, 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 know, I, know that, I know that, but what I'm saying is, the, one of the reasons they feel so comfortable is, first of all, of course, it's their culture, it's their religion. For example, I come from a Jewish background. So, if, let's say, among back my old friends, if we were having, like, observing some Jewish holiday, sure, you could invite anyone, everyone will come, because that's their religion, or Christian. If you come from a, Jew, a Christian background, that's why, for example, if there's sort of a dynamic uh, Christian movement, that's why you, like, you have these Christian startup churches. Or some guy or some, you know, a couple, man and woman, they'll start a little thing in their garage and then it turns into a mega church with 10 or 20,000 members. So when you're, when you're trying to get people to come back to the religion they were born in, it's obviously a very different dynamic. And so my point is that um, we have to create a situation as far as possible, precisely because this is so strange and new and different for, for almost everybody in the West. That's why we have to go out of our way to make it comfortable for them, like Mahesha was saying. So, so that, you know, yeah, we just have to make it, do everything humanly possible to make it comfortable for Western people to associate with us and participate in our programs. So we have one solution that we are adding here in UK, and we'll be happy to hear. Uh, we had a meeting called Vision 2020. Of course, it's coming very close now uh -huh. uh, for... Uh, you know, forward thinking up to 20, uh, what do we want to see? So when we were gathering, so that's when I suggested also that, you know, proper disciples who are Western bodied, they're going through all the training, now they're in Vanaprastha. Why shouldn't they be traveling and preaching and opening centers? Exactly. And uh, but, it's, you know, but, I, but I think that here's the reason. Here's the reason, I think. Because if you're, let's say you're playing a game, like a soccer game, or a cricket game, or a basketball game, whatever, at a certain point, if you realize you're, you're going to lose the game, you know, let's say you're in a game, there's five minutes left in the game, or whatever, and you're really behind, obviously you keep playing, but you know you're going to lose. And when you know you're going to lose the game, you don't play that hard. And so the way we present, we need to come up with a standard, a Western Hare Krishna movement, so that, you know, again, according to Prabhupada's principles, so that we have a chance to win. If you're in a game and you actually have a chance to win, then you really play hard. So, you know, people can go up in a center, but we already know what's going to happen. No one's going to come. Or very few people are going to come. And so, because we haven't got a, a format, like Mahesh, I mean, you made the point, I mean, you, you come up with something which does work. So if we could have 
come up with innovative, relevant ways to reach Western people. So if devotees felt there's really a chance we could win, I think more people would want to get involved if they have support, because they know I'm joining an alliance. It's not just me against the world. I'm part of something which is growing, which is developing, which is relevant, which can work. So that's what I think we need. But I agree with so you. So it is happening in grassroots form here in UK, where they have Saturday program for Westerners, and they're doing all kind of innovative stuff, like you're saying. So, but like you said, we need to join forces. Yeah, but you see, but you see, you know, you see yeah. And also, here's another very key point. ISKCON has lots of bridge programs, but it is, in a sense, the bridge to nowhere. You know, whether it's in Australia, New Zealand, UK. In other words, when people come to a program, that's great, it's relevant, it's nice, but then what, what are they joining? In other words, where is the movement that they feel comfortable with? If they look on the other side of the bridge and don't feel comfortable, they're not going to cross the bridge. And so what we need is not only bridge programs, but an actual Western Hare Krishna movement, so there's something comfortable to join. I think that's, uh, sorry, I'm not taking too long, sorry, this is the last point. So with the bridge program, what happens in Iskon, automatically we have monthly big major festivals every month. So they naturally get uh, caught into it, you see? And how do you think we have so many new initiates joining, actually, in some countries, I would say, even here in India? Uh, not, 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 not Western. So many new initiates coming from the West, no. Even I, I saw the documentary film made by uh, Soho. They made a film about their temple. And uh, it was mostly Indians and Russians. And so my, my point is that if you have a monthly festival, People, we need, people need festivals, they need ashrams, but we have to have a whole self-contained program, festivals, ashrams, everything which is Western friendly. Otherwise, you have a bridge program, they like it, but then when they go to the festival, it's a little different than what they are used to. And I think that's... My last comment here. Yes. I would say, wake up, prophet disciples. Wake up, prophet disciples. Do it. Just do it. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. I want to give just some evidence. Um, there's, uh, we did our books at our weddings. And uh, one gentleman we gave a Bhagavad Gita to, he read the whole thing. He loved it. He called, he called us back. Uh, and we got him all prophets' books. He's now at the third canto. He's chanting eight. 18 rounds a day. He's in um, Houston. So, like, he was in town one time. He was so discouraged because it was all Hindus during in Seattle. He was all, you know, he's just chanting a few rounds a day, but he's done so for over a year. And he's written for but he went to the Seattle Temple, the same problem. He felt so discouraged. He just, there was no one he could really relate to. Exactly. So I think something yeah. That's exactly really it. needs to be done. Yeah, we need a Western Hare Krishna movement. I mean, that's, thank you, Narari. Those are very good examples. So, I'm afraid, are there any more questions? Well, we just hoping, Maharaj, maybe you can give us more classes. Oh, who's that speaking? Yuga Rasa. Oh, Yuga Rasa, how are you? Thank you very well. Thank you so much for taking your time and giving us such a wonderful... It's a course. pleasure. I, I remember how you hosted me. <laughs> Thank you for being our host. <laughs> Hare Krishna, yes, I, I, we, we, we'll do more classes. I'll speak to Ramananda. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Thank you so much for giving class today. Um, I live in the middle of nowhere and have no internet and haven't been to the Honolulu temple or any temple for 15 years. Who is this? I'm so happy. Who is this? My name is Mah Maharani Devi Dasi. Oh, Hare Krishna. And I'm so to, give, to hear you give class today. Um, I just wanted to ask you something pretty much off the yes. subject. I heard somehow or other that you did um, some translations to the Mahabharata, and I was wondering if they had all been put into a book and if I could get the book. And 
if you recommended a translation, a long translation like Ungulis or Dutch, right, or right. which long translation you might recommend? Uh, I have to get away to finish my own Mahabharata work. In the meantime, there are some translations which you can find on hdgoswami.com. And it's all free, I mean, recordings and, and hopefully some text. And then uh, Ganguly is sort of reliable. It's not, I wouldn't call it spiritually inspired, but it is accurate. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Hare Krishna. You, Prabhu, you have to forgive me for pulling the plug here. Please, please. But I, I, Maharaj, I don't want to abuse your time. Uh, very enlivened in class. Wonderful discussion. Everything is great. Forgive me for anybody that I had muted because we have to control. There's a lot of devotees online. I'm not sorry there was noise. But, um, <coughs> Maharaj, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, I, and I really my thanks to everybody who participated, and uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity to do some service. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you. Huh?